Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasala with Audioholics, and today I would like to talk to you about amplifier classes, the various kind of amplifiers that are out there, power amplifiers in particular, even used in some AV receivers. I'm not going to make this a super techie kind of video. We're not going to be talking about VB multipliers, Miller effects, parasitics, and all that crap. This is not an engineering class video. This is a cursory overview of the various amplifier classes with the goal in mind to help you make more informed purchasing decisions so you can figure out what kind of amplifier you want in your home theater or your two channel system. So I want to go over this article that we have that we've done um, many years back actually, but it's still one of the most popular articles on our website and I think it's a good thing to go over. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the various amplifier classes, I wanted to go over with you what a waveform is because we do talk about waveforms a lot in this video. And here we have a sinusoid. And basically what this is, is it starts at zero, then it goes to the positive. So, so from zero to 180, it goes back to zero, and then it goes negative, and then it goes back to zero again. That's a full wavelength. 360 degrees is a full wavelength, and we're going to be talking about wavelengths a lot. So if you get confused, you can look at this diagram of a sinusoid, and you can understand when we're talking about this is a quarter wavelength, that's a half wavelength, that's three quarters of a wavelength. This is a full wavelength from zero to 360 degrees. And I wanted to start with the most basic, traditional kind of amplifier, the audiophile holy grail, class A amplification. This is the best in terms of um, distortion, in terms of linearity, but there's a catch to this. Class A is very inefficient. It's the most inefficient kind of amplifier to use. In fact, I would not recommend a class A amplifier if you're going beyond 25, maybe 50 watts. You're basically using a space heater. You think about it for a minute, you're looking at between 10 to 30% efficiency in a class A amplifier. Let's just say 25% to make things make the math simple. If you have a 25 watt amplifier, you're dissipating 100 watts of power to get that 25 watts to your speaker. Can you imagine trying to do that to seven speakers or, or with Atmos 11 speakers? You're talking about not having enough power from two wall outlets to do that. And it's just not a good idea to use class A for anything other than low power applications or even like headphone preamps, for example. I think that's really the best kind of scenario you want to use class A for. I think the days of class A are numbered. There's still, you'll still find it in esoteric amps like this Pass Labs, for example, but it's a space here, man. I've tested these amplifiers before. You could cook eggs on them. They sound good, but you're wasting so much power. And there's really no viable reason to do that anymore when amplifier technology has evolved way beyond that these days. So what's a compromise that you can get with higher efficiency? They came up with class B. And what class B is, is you have one output device that conducts on the positive waveform, one output that device that conducts on the negative waveform. So just to go back to the class A, I just wanted to show you in this case, that output device, the BJT, that's conducting all the time. That's conducting for a full waveform, 360 degrees. It's always on. That's why you're dissipating so much power and wasting so much power. But with class B, you've got kind of a push-pull scheme where you have a positive uh, waveform going to one transistor and a negative waveform going to the other transistor. You theoretically can get up to 78.5% efficiency you typically don't get that high. You maybe get maybe 70% when the amplifier is driven to max power. But there's a huge trade-off to Class B, which is why nobody uses Class B in our industry. Nobody uses it for audiophile applications. You get what's called crossover distortion. And this is a distortion that happens during the transition from the positive um, output to the negative output. This is very measurable, and it's also audible, and it's very undesirable. So we had to come up, or engineers had to come up with a compromise to that, and they came out with what's called Class AB amplification. And that's kind of a hybrid between Class B and Class A. So what they did is um, they shift the output devices, so they're not conducting, they're not stopping conduction at 180 degrees, they're going maybe between 180 and 200. They move that shift point, but they also make the output devices conduct all the time at very low power level, 
usually let's say one to five watts. So you're kind of running at a very low class A amplification. And what that does is that completely eliminates the crossover distortion. You can't measure it anymore. You can't hear it anymore. You're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting close to class B efficiency and you're getting very close to class A linearity. And this is why it's one of the most popular amplifiers still used today. I mean, if you look, most amplifiers that you buy today are class AB. And there's reasons for that because they're easy to produce. We've reached the limits of technology of class AB. You know, we've, we've designed them so well these days, so efficient in terms of how to, to fit everything into a chassis. It, they just work. They're very consistent sounding regardless of what kind of speaker load that they drive which some amplifiers aren't, and we'll get more into that in a minute. And you can see here a typical class AB amplifier. You got your PNPs and your NPN transistors, and it's a push-pull scheme, so this will drive the output. You get close to the 70% when this thing is at max load, and it's a great kind of amplification. And you even see some of the um, esoteric designs that will, they will give you a higher class A bias if you want, like for example, this Emotiva amp that's no longer in production gave you about 30 watts of class A amplification for those that wanted it, but it, usually you would turn that switch off to save on heat and you get very close to the same performance. So now the next series or the next class of amplification is class G and class H. Really these aren't a separate class of amplification, they're more of a subset of class AB. It's just that they add some circuit components to make these amplifiers more efficient, especially at the lower power levels. And, and they do better when they drive in higher power levels. And there's a reason for that. And I wanted to show you a typical class G scheme, which is this little outlaw amplifier uses. So what happens here is you've got two rails of power um, for the positive and usually for the negative. And at the low power levels, when the signal is below 35 volts in this case, you're using the lower rail voltage for the signal. But once it exceeds that, you see this diode turns on and it goes to the higher power source or the higher rail voltage. And for higher power applications, you're gonna see uh, the amplifier conduct at the 70 volts. And you really want, for the best efficiency, you want that amplifier to conduct the signal close to the rail voltage because you get the max efficiency. By having this multi-rail scheme, you ensure that the amplifier has more efficiency at the low power because it's on this lower voltage. It's not always running that 70 volt rail and it's just more efficient. You, you, you could use smaller heat sinks in this case. And it's just, uh, you know, it's a great kind of design when you could do something like that. Now they could take it even one step further and do what's called class H. And I'll show you in a second, um, an Emotiva amplifier that I used to use called the XPR1. That used the class H topology. And what that does is that modulates the power supply. So that way the signal voltage is always a few volts below the rail voltage. And I wanna show you uh, some of the measurements here. So first I wanted to show you, um, this is the XPR1 that I was talking about. These are these giant eight ohm resistors that I had to use to test it because this thing put out two kilowatts in the four ohms, it was a beast. But I wanted to show you a typical schematic to show you how complex this can become. So you can see there's a lot of circuit elements here. You've got your multi-rail, you've got your logic to help you modulate the rail depending on how much power it's delivering. This is a complex circuit. This is one of the reasons why Emotiva no longer makes this amplifier because it just, it was hard to service. It was heavy with that big um, power supply, the linear power supply, and it wasn't a modular design. So I don't want to get too much off topic other than to say, in my opinion, the best amplifier Emotiva has ever made was the XPR series. So if you've got XPR amplifiers in your house, don't give them up. They were awesome amplifiers. I miss mine. And I don't think the Gen 3 amps that they're doing now are to this level of performance based on the measurements that I've seen some by other credible magazines like Stereophile. But, you know, everybody's always perfecting their stuff, so we'll see how that goes down the road if we ever get them on our test bench to look at. But I wanted to show you what happens when you do this multi-rail switching scheme. Now, this case with the Emotiva, this is a very good design. What you see is you get this switchover distortion when you go from the linear class AB over to switching to the higher rail. You can see this little bump in distortion. 
On older designs, this would be way higher, way audible. It'd be over maybe sometimes 1%. But you can see this is a good design. This thing is very linear. It's very low distortion. And when you're getting up to 600 watts, it's very unlikely you're going to hear this little rise in distortion at the switchover point. To be honest with you, if you're running your amp that high continuously, you probably don't have any hearing left to begin with. But you can see it's under 0.01% when it switches over and then it drops back down. And we're talking about an amplifier now that's able to deliver two kilowatts of power. You know, you're not going to get this kind of power with a regular linear AB amplifier. It's very hard to do that. You're going to run out of current from your outlet if you don't have a better kind of efficiency to give it this kind of power level. So that's really impressive. But I wanted to show you just a regular linear AB amplifier, how the distortion profile looks. This is the Anthem STR amplifier that I'm currently testing. Very good amplifier. And this thing is putting out, you know, 763 watts at 1%, 723 watts at 0.1%. That's two channels driven four ohms. You can see this is just a linear AB. There's no cross, uh, no switchover distortion here. This is just a very straight line. When you see it, when you see a distortion profile that's horizontal like this, you've got yourself a good amplifier. And if you see this thing getting all weird and wiggly, then you know you got some problems, especially when it goes back up at the, above the knee. And we've seen some receivers do some crazy stuff because of the current limiting, but you don't get that in a good amplifier design like this. So I want to go over the other classes before we get into this other stuff I wanted to show you. Let me get back and share with you that article we were talking about. So the next kind of class of amplification is called class D. You might have heard this is called digital amplification. It's really not digital amplification. It's still typically analog. You still have uh, an amplifier here that runs. This time it's being modulated with pulse width modulation and it makes those output devices, usually MOSFETs, switch really quickly. And because they're switching really quickly, it makes the amplifier very efficient. You don't have to use as big of a heat sink at all in this case because a typical class D amplifier has anywhere between 90, 97% efficiency. This is a great solution when you're doing high channel density, when you're doing car audio applications. Class D amplification has come a long way over the last few years. This is a viable option to be looking at. Do not, audiophiles do not snuff these class D amps. Some of them are really good. Now there's usually two types of class D amplifiers. You have the ones that have analog um, output in terms of the feedback that they use, and then you have the ones that are digitally controlled with a DAC. Um, I'm not gonna get really into too much of the nitty gritty behind that, other than there's just two formulas for doing class D. Usually the best ones still have the uh, analog kind of uh, circuitry in them, the analog control, and um, you get some excellent performance with that. But the problem you get with some of these class Ds I wanna go over with you is the output filter. If this isn't matched correctly, you can get some erroneous frequency response output, and it changes how the amplifier sounds depending on the load or the loudspeaker that you're driving. And that's what I wanted to show you here. I wanted to show you basically a good design versus a not so good design. So in this case, we have this little pint size amplifier from a company called IQ Audio. It's a 300 watt amplifier. This is a really good design because if you look at how the frequency response is, it doesn't change whether it's not loaded, whether it's eight ohm load or whether it's four ohm loaded. The frequency response is very consistent. What that tells you is this amplifier is gonna sound similar no matter what kind of loudspeaker load it drives. Kudos to these guys because these amps are getting better and better all the time. But years ago, we tested an Axiom audio amplifier. It's their eight channel amplifier. This thing was a bit of a hot mess. It delivered a lot of power, but it was really optimized for four ohm loads. You can see what happened here when I drove an eight ohm load, the frequency peaking above 20K. If I drove this thing without a load and just ran it maybe at like 100 watts, I think I remember, or just whatever voltage that was, um, with no load, this was oscillating so high that it actually blew the amplifier out and caught, and caught on fire. And they've since then uh, discontinued this version of the amplifier and they've come out with a new version, which I haven't tested. But this was a poor design and it did sound very different depending on the load it was driving. I do recommend that if you do look at getting a class D amplifier, to look at the frequency response uh, under various load conditions, and then you'll get an idea of how this thing is gonna perform with your speakers. 
very important that you guys look at that. And uh, we do some of that testing uh, to make sure when we do our output device testing on, on these amplifiers, we look at load versus no load. We look at the output impedance. We look at the frequency response. We look at the distortion. You know, we have articles and videos on, on how we do amplifier testing, and you will find this data when we test these amplifiers. So this is that little IQ audio amp I was telling you about. The little pint-sized amplifier delivered 300 watts and four ohms. You can't get that with a linear AB amplifier. So there's some advantages to class D amplifiers, as you can see here. And I just wanted to show you an efficiency output graph. This is a useful graph. This again shows you the efficiency. When you're looking at class D, you're at almost full efficiency when you're driving this thing at you know, 40 or 50% power. You're getting very close to the 95, you know, 90, sometimes 95% efficiency. But with class AB, traditional class AB, you're not getting its max efficiency till you're almost at full power with this amplifier. Now again, if you have a class G or a class H version, this improves this a little bit because now you're switching to the rail at the lower rail voltage at these lower power levels and you're not dissipating as much power on the, on the high rails. So again, class AB is, 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 is a decent efficiency, but it's a very consistent sound regardless of load impedance, whereas class D is the most efficient, but you gotta make sure you've got one with a good output filter, good post filter feedback, and they're getting better and better because there are companies now, I'd say there's three major players that make good class D amplification. There's Hypex, there's Pascal, and now the new ICE modules are looking really good. They're much better than the old generation. Back in the day when ICE was putting their amplifiers in the Pioneer receivers, we tested the SC07, I believe. That thing fell apart at four ohms when you tested it above two or three kilohertz. Most of the magazines miss that because they only test power at one kilohertz. We, of course, test full power bandwidth at eight ohms and four ohms. The old Class D from ICE was really meant for subwoofer amplification. It was not ready to be put in a receiver, but their newer generation stuff's getting better. And in fact, I'm actually a champion now of putting Class D into AB receivers because we're looking now at receivers that are not five or seven channels. We're looking at receivers that are nine or 11 channels and they're not getting bigger power supplies in these receivers. They're just stuffing more amplifiers on a small heat sink and they're stamping Atmos and all these different kind of streaming technologies. And what happens when you do that? You're trading features, you're trading quality for features. So you're not gonna be able to deliver the kind of power levels you want for all these channels driven. And that's where Class D is a real advantage. If it's done right, you're gonna get more power per dollar with your, all your channels driven on a Class D kind of receiver than you are of a traditional linear AB. So I'm looking forward to eventually testing the new Pioneer receivers to see how their D3 module works. I know there's a lot of installers that like those receivers. I know a lot of people swear by them. So the technology is getting better. Class D is becoming a viable solution. I think it's the wave of the future, especially when you're dealing with high channel densities for immersive surround sound. Class A is really meant for low power applications, whether you're doing desktop audio or you're doing a headphone kind of uh, preamp. That's the only time I recommend Class A. But Class AB is a good old faithful design. You can't go wrong with Class AB, especially if you're doing high power and you have a Class G or better yet, a Class H kind of topology that gives you the higher efficiency at the lower rails when it's low at low power, and then it bumps up and you want over a kilowatt of power. Class H is a great solution. Like I said, I had the Emotiva XPR1s, and I was cranking those things. My speakers dipped down to two ohms, and in a 6,000 cubic foot room, those amplifiers never got hot. They had a lot of heat sink area. They were efficient with the way they did the power supply. Linear AB amplifiers are still very viable, especially if you're doing some trickery in the circuits to give you the higher efficiency at low power and high power by doing the multi-rail and doing the modulation on the rails. So guys, that's about all I wanted to tell you about with the different types of classes of amplification. Let me know what kind of amplifier you're using in your system, or if you're thinking about getting a new amp, what's your favorite kind of amp? And if you're running an old tube or a triode amp that's class A, you know, comment down below. I wanna hear about it. I wanna hear why you're sticking to the old technology, why you wanna cook eggs on an amplifier when you're not listening to music. I'm sure you've got your reasons, 
but the science has evolved beyond inefficiency. We've gotten so good to the point that technology can sound good and still be very efficient. You really should be looking at the more efficient designs, especially if you're building a system with high channel density. So that's all I wanted to tell you guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it gave you some insights to figure out what you want to buy next in terms of amplifiers. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.